Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. We have a fantastic episode planned for you this week with all sorts of amazing new paleontological discoveries to talk about, including two new dinosaurs, a new mosasaur, and some very unusual fossils showing decapitated prehistoric marine reptiles. Well, it's been a very productive week for paleontology news, and starting us off is a new dinosaur named from sub-Antarctic Chile. This dinosaur is named Goncocan Nanoi, and it dates back to the start of the very last stage of the Cretaceous period. It's represented by parts of the skull, limbs, ribs, and vertebrae, and tells a very interesting story about how these dinosaurs dispersed across the planet. Goncocan is a hadrosauroid, one of the duck-billed dinosaurs. However, it is not a member of the more advanced group called the hadrosaurids. This is very interesting because at this point in the Cretaceous, non-hadrosaurid duckbills had been replaced by the hadrosaurids, and other fossils of duckbilled dinosaurs found further north in Patagonia all belong to the hadrosaurids too. So it seems that Goncocan potentially represents a relict lineage of duckbilled dinosaurs that split off in North America before the origin of the hadrosaurids and spread all the way to the subantarctic of South America. This lineage was then outcompeted by the hadrosaurids everywhere else, except in the far south where the hadrosaurids apparently never arrived. The authors suggest that all other possible reported hadrosauroid bones from the subantarctic and the antarctic might therefore be from relatives of Goncocan and not represent hadrosaurids. It's a really fascinating new discovery, showing how complex patterns of dinosaur evolution and dispersion could get during the changing world of the Cretaceous. Up next, we have a paper describing a new species of dolphin with tusk-like teeth. Named Nihohai matakoi, from the Oligocene of New Zealand about 25 million years ago, this is a very interesting species, known from an almost complete skull and some bones from the body. Several of the preserved teeth of this dolphin all project forwards and out to the sides, including all the incisors and canines. Other features of this dolphin's anatomy, including the unfused neck vertebrae and the fairly flat rostrum, suggest that the animal used these teeth to stun prey by swinging its head quickly from side to side with its flexible neck. The lack of much wear or scratch marks on the teeth rules out the possibility that Nihohai was using them to dig through sediment on the seafloor, and they're also quite delicate, suggesting they weren't being used in fighting members of their own species, or in predator defence. It's an absolutely brilliant new discovery, adding to the known diversity of cetaceans in the fossil record, and revealing a very unusual new kind of feeding method for these animals. Also in the news for this week is the naming of a new species of ankylosaur, the famous armoured dinosaurs. This new species was discovered in rocks on the Isle of Wight, the so-called Dinosaur Island of the UK, and dates back to the early part of the Cretaceous period. Named Vectipelter baratai, the name comes from the old Roman name for the Isle of Wight, Vectis, and Pelter, the Latin for shield. The species name, baratai, is a very nice tribute to British paleontologist Paul Barrett, who has made many significant contributions to the science. The material known for Vectipelta is fairly complete, including much of the vertebral column, parts of the limbs, many pieces of bony armour called osteoderms, and most of the sacral shield of the hip. Now the discovery of this ankylosaur is important for a few reasons, including the fact that up until now, most of the ankylosaurian material recovered from the Isle of Wight had all just been referred to the well-known British taxon Polacanthus. But clearly these animals were more diverse than we had appreciated, and there's more than just Polacanthus here. Additionally, Vectipelta has turned out to not be very closely related to Polacanthus, nor to the other named Ankylosaur genus from the same geological group, Hyliosaurus. Instead, Vectipelta is actually most closely related to a couple of species of Ankylosaur known from China, suggesting that some complex waves of dispersal to and from Europe and Asia were occurring at this time in the Cretaceous. The authors also recommend that material referred to Polycanthus in museums should probably be re-examined, to see if these fossils might actually represent something new, or indeed more Vectipelta. An absolutely wonderful new paper describing a very important ankylosaur, and a lovely tribute to Professor Paul Barrett. Next we have a very interesting and quite unusual paper describing fossils preserving instances of prehistoric marine reptiles that have been decapitated. In a paper quite dramatically titled Decapitation in the Long-Necked Triassic Marine Reptile Tanistrophius, paleontologists describe two specimens of the extremely long-necked archosauromorph that have completely severed heads. Both these specimens preserve the heads and part of the elongated neck, however in both cases they abruptly end in broken vertebrae and associated vertebral ribs. 
Both specimens also preserve bite marks near the severed parts of the neck, providing more evidence that these decapitations occurred due to an attack from another marine reptile. Although it's possible that these do represent instances of scavenging, the authors favour the hypothesis that the heads were lost during an active predation event, as the remaining neck and skull bones are all still articulated with each other, suggesting there had been little tissue decay when they became buried. The attacker of these Tanistrophus individuals was most likely a Nothosaur or possibly an Ichthyosaur, based on the spacing between bite marks. These fossils therefore show that although long necks in marine reptiles were apparently a very successful body plan as they evolved independently in many different lineages, they were still particularly vulnerable to predation and apparently represent a functional weak spot. An absolutely fantastic paper there then, describing a very vivid instance of prehistoric behaviour preserved in the fossil record. And finally for the news this week, there's also been a new mosasaur described. Named Sarabosaurus dali, it comes from late Cretaceous aged rocks in Utah and is actually now the oldest known mosasaurid from the western interior seaway of North America, living about 94 million years ago. Interestingly, this new mosasaur preserves a pattern of blood vessels on one of the bones of the skull base that was before now thought to have only been present in a later diverging lineage of mosasaurs called the Plioplaticarpines. Looking at some other mosasaur species, they also found that this feature, or the beginnings of it, are present in other taxa too, and so the definition of what Plioplaticarpines include is expanded in this paper, and it's found that this mosasaur lineage must have diverged from the Tylosaurine mosasaurs sometime in the late Cenomanian or early Turonian stages of the late Cretaceous. So a very important discovery that continues to further resolve our understanding of mosasaur evolution. Well that's it for the paleontology news, and what a week it's been. I really hope you enjoyed learning about all these fantastic discoveries, and we'll see you next week.